Hello, everyone, and welcome to another great week with Humanist Association of San Diego. Each week, we meditate on certain themes, and the themes for today are collaboration and progressive syncretism. Syncretism, of course, being a concept where you take different cultural attributes and you take the best of something to combine it to make something greater. So collaboration and progressive syncretism. As, as we've been going on with, with our current programming, we have been inviting members of different faiths. And I think it's fascinating that we are, we're getting an interest from, from, from people of different religions to come together as humanists, even people of faith calling themselves humanists with a focus on our shared humanity. And we've been inviting members of other faith groups so we can learn together, and especially the clergy of other faith groups so we can have honest, candid discussions. Over the last year, we've had our, our Native and Indigenous friends who have shown up. We've had a meeting with members of Kahal Am, members of the San Diego Humanistic Jewish community. We've had Skip LaRue, a Methodist minister, talking about the communitarian aspects of Methodism. We've had Mark Day, a Franciscan priest. In our regular meetings, we're getting church-going folks who teach Sunday school, and also we're attracting friends who are evangelical Christians. And I think it's rather remarkable that it demonstrates the core values that unite us through humanism, through our common humanity, and our shared outlook to make this a better world. So today, in this drive to understand each other, to see the best in each other, and also to connect with members of other faith groups that may not have a connection, known connection to atheists, agnostics, deists, and in humanists, we are ambassadors for humanism. And typically, when people of other faith groups come and join us, and this isn't just recently, this is going back years to 2006, when a group of Muslim men showed up to one of our third Sunday meetings, and they said, we're really disappointed because we thought we'd come to, come to a, a vicious argument, but we liked you guys. And so we're finding that when the clergy come, who don't typically have a connection to humanists, they say that they're leaving with a ton of new friends. And when we can build bridges during this divisive time, we have done something truly valuable. So today we have Dr. Karen Steinoff. And I am so glad that Dr. Karen Steinoff is here. And we're going to talk about Unitarianism. Jeremy is going to help run the presentation and facilitate the dialogue afterwards, but we're going to learn about Unitarianism, which there's such a close connection between humanism and Unitarianism. It strikes me that the best that religion can offer is pro-social, and the worst is divisive and particular. And we see that through the evolution of religion, specifically in progressive religious institutions and congregations, that people eschew the more inhospitable aspects and commands of the strictures that are against the demands of human beings living in the modern world. And, and those don't typically reconcile with everything that had been learned since, uh, learned before and especially since. And the Unitarians are great examples of, of religious individuals and religious congregations that eschew all of the garbage, all of the baggage that anchors us to, to, to putting people in particular boxes, to compartmentalize people in terms of hierarchies of worth, such as if you're gay or lesbian, you're a worthless sinner that needs to repent. The Unitarians, no, 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 no. And the Unitarians are people that we can learn from. And going back a long time, 
I want to bring up one name, Michael Servetus. Michael Servetus. If you know who Michael Servetus was, he was the, one of the first true Unitarians. He, 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 he said that this idea of the Trinity was non-biblical. It was something that came later, and he was burned at the stake at the command of John Calvin. The irony being that the Unitarian Universalists sprung out of Calvinist congregations in Massachusetts in the 17th century. And as I'm saying about collaboration, shewing the, the worst of religion, promoting the best, which is humanistic, the Unitarians do so. They absolutely do so because much like ethical culture and humanists, Unitarians realize that religion is a human invention and what is, what's the good of, of this human invention if it's not serving the broader needs of humanity but actually serving as an obstacle. And the Unitarians guide themselves by seven principles. And these seven principles are humanistic, not supernatural. And they do have six sources that they draw inspiration from, and five of them are supernatural, but one of them, I think it's of keen interest to us. And that's the fifth source saying that humanist teachings, which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science, warn us against the idolatries of the mind and spirit. So in closing out my opening marks, leaving some food for thought, about collaboration and progressive syncretism, there's much that we share with people of faith. And what we share with people of faith is the common foundation of our shared humanity. And while supernaturalism and tribalism ca causes certain groups of, of religious people to forget that we're connected and, and leave obstacles in the path of our interconnectedness, it's our drop job as humanists to keep them on track and to remind those individuals that humanity comes first. And as I say every week, we are humanists, we are here to help, and that is how we help. By serving is that reminder that humanity comes first and one religious sect that, that puts humanity before supernaturalism is Unitarianism. So Jeremy, I'm going to hand this meeting off to you and our distinguished guest. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much, Jason, for a, a great introduction. And uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my PowerPoint in a moment. But before I do so, I just wanna give you guys and kind of run down. We're going to use a PowerPoint. We're going to basically introduce what Unitarianism, Universalism is, uh, its origins, and then we're going to put up a set of questions that Karen and I are going to go over. And then after we do our part and go over those questions, we will open it up to general discussion and questions. And as Jason said before, uh, please put those in the chat. Uh, this way, Michelle and Jason can get them to me and I can ask them to Karen, or if we want you, we'll ask you to unmute and you can ask your question yourself of Karen. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And... And here we go. As Jason said, we're the Humanist Association of San Diego. And also, I'm glad you can see our wonderful new logo. And as I said, this is a talk with Unitarian Universalists. And as I introduce Dr. Karen Stoyanoff, she is a affiliate community minister of the Unitarian Universalists in Fullerton, California. She's Minister Emerita of the Unitarian Universalist Orange Coast, and also Minister Emerita of the Unitarian Universalist in Anaheim. And just give you some background on Karen. Uh, her hometown is Rockford, Illinois. She earned a master's degree and became an English literature teacher, got married and had three sons, then returned to work as a consultant for an educationally gifted program. 
After her first marriage, or when her first marriage ended, she returned to the university and earned a PhD and met her second husband. And together with her second husband formed a small business uh, and education consulting program. This eventually morphed into being hired at Chicago Urban University as an administrator and professor teaching education and psychology classes. And then a new direction started. Uh, Karen received a calling to ministry. She returned to school for a master's degree, followed by ordination as a Unitarian Universalist minister. Uh, in the process of searching for a congregation, that's what brought her to Orange County, and this is where Karen has resided for the past 23 years. After serving as parish minister for two congregations, Karen retired in 2019, and Karen now pursues racial and social justice activities full time. And this is how I met Karen, because we're on a couple of different uh, boards together. We sit on different committees together, so that's been a pleasure. And uh, also, Karen holds board positions with the Orange County Human Relations Foundation, the Orange County Interfaith Network, and the Unitarian Universalist Justice Ministry in California. And she also maintains membership in the Sheriff's Interfaith Advisory Committee, Faith Leaders Council of United to End Homelessness, Orange County Alliance for Racial Equity, O'Care, yay, and Clergy and Laity United for Economic Justice, CLU. And the most important part, which is at the end, Karen is an avid reader. She has been since childhood. And in her spare time, she doesn't just read voraciously, but she's an avid fan of movies and theater and especially loves spending time with her two adored grandchildren and her three beloved dogs. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to Dr. Karen Stoyanoff. Thanks, Jeremy. Are you gonna spotlight me or do I? Yes, I am. There we go. Well, first of all, Jason, what a wonderful introduction. I feel like you practically could give the speech. And um, let me just listen. Uh, I, I wanna tell you that I knew I was a humanist long before I knew I was a Unitarian Universalist. And um, the other thing I wanna say just as an intro is that um, pretty much in every congregation in the United States, uh, right around 50% of the people who consider themselves members also identify as atheists. And the other 50% kind of noodle around with a bunch of other things. Uh, but hardly, it would be a very small group who would consider themselves primarily theist. And that's, that's an important thing when we're looking at what's the synchronicity between uh, humanists and uh, uh, the, uh, the Unitarian communities. So, I thought I would start out by talking about the symbol that you would see most frequently if you went to anything that was sponsored by Unitarians. And that is the flaming chalice, which you see uh, in the upper corner of the uh, thing that's on the screen right now. And the story of the flaming chalice started in 1936 when two Unitarian ministers, Wade Still and Martha Sharp, were posted to Czechoslovakia. And while they were there, they became aware of what was going on in Europe. And they assisted Unitarians, I mean, they assisted primarily Jewish persons who were threatened by the Nazis to escape from Europe. And that at the same time that they were doing that, a man named Charles Joy, who just become the director of a newly founded organization called the Unitarian Service Committee, met with Hans Deutsch. And he is the one who designed the symbol that you see of the flaming chalice. And the way they used it was that if there was a safe uh, place for Jewish people to go to begin to be transported out of Europe uh, 
to probably the United States, but definitely out of Europe, they uh, would put a chalice on the front of the building in the window or affix it somehow to the building so that people would know it was the safe symbol and that they would be safe there. But the Nazis wouldn't know that that's what was going on because obviously the Nazis would have closed down any of those points of beginning the journey. And when the war was over in the United States and uh, things opened up, the story of the flaming chalice came back to us living in the United States and people were entranced with it. They loved it. They loved what it stood for and they loved how it fit with what most people who were Unitarians wanted in the world. And so congregations started adopting it and using it as part of their service. And over the years since the end of World War II, just about every UU congregation has uh, adopted the flaming chalice. And I'm gonna be saying this several times during our talk. There's very little that UUs have to do. In fact, if you tell a UU they have to believe or do something, they'll resist. They don't wanna be told what they have to do. So there isn't a rule that says you have to use a flaming chalice. And I think that's why almost all of us do. The flaming chalice can represent anything to us today. It depends on what the service is going to be about, if we're going to talk about it. And there isn't an automatic only one thing that it means. But at the UU congregation in Fullerton, one of the things we say at the end of the uh, service is, we extinguish our chalice, but not the light of truth, the fire of commitment, or the warmth of community. These we carry with us wherever we may go. And that's sort of a generally accepted understanding of what the flaming chalice is all about today. The fire of commitment is most often lived out in terms of justice work. But it doesn't have to be. You can be committed to whatever good thing you are trying to bring to the world you live in. So as I thought about what I would want to tell you, <clears throat> I realized that I couldn't tell you what Unitarians and Universalists are about without giving you at least a short history lesson in terms of the United States. And so um, I have to tell you that when I first came to California at the church that I was serving initially in Costa Mesa, when they were going to have a meeting for people who might want to join, the chair of the membership committee told me, and we're giving you 15 minutes, Karen, to explain you you history. And I looked at her and I said, you know, usually Unitarians would claim they don't believe in miracles. But if you think I can cover over 200 years of history for two traditions in 15 minutes, evidently you do. I don't think I ever made it fully through in quite 15 minutes, but I came very close to creating that miracle. So here we go. The um, Unitarians came from England via uh, Europe to the United States on a ship called the Mayflower. Some of you know about the Mayflower, so I don't have to tell you that story. I can tell you that today, we very proudly claim the Mayflower as our entry into what became the United States, as does the United Church of Christ, the Congregationalist, uh, which is what I grew up. So I claim I'm my own cousin. Uh, having become a UU. At any rate, the Unitarians object, uh, oh, I guess I should say, when I started to think about how I was going to cover history that quickly, I decided I needed to have a common theme 
And as I thought about the history of the two faith traditions, I realized that the thing that uh, follows us through to today is that we're heretics. If someone ever asks you, tell me about the Unitarian Universalists, you can say, they're a bunch of heretics, and they always have been. We always came together as a group who said, that's not what we believe, or that's not how we think it goes. And the Unitarians objected to the idea that there was a trinity. Jason referred to that with Michael Servetus. That was true in England as well. And so the Unitarians that came to the United States said, it doesn't say that in the Bible anywhere. And God is God. We, we don't need this three-part God. So that was a unified or united God figure at the uh, origin time. And the Universalists, who also came from England a little later, but nevertheless, came to the United States. They were objecting to John Calvin, who said that some people are saved and some people are damned. And God makes that decision before you're even born. And they said, no God worth believing in would tell you that it, you were damned or saved before you were even born. There is a God that would save everyone. And that's the God we believe in, the God of love. And so they were universalists because they believed in universal salvation. So those were the two first uh, uh, heresies that came to the United States. In fact, it said that the Unitarians, who didn't object to the Calvinists, I mean, the rejection of Calvinism, the Unitarians believed they were too good for any God to ever damn them. And the Universalists believed that God was too good to ever damn anyone. And so that's how they started out. The next heresy that really was major came from a man named Theodore Parker, who was a Bostonian Unitarian minister. And long before it became common, he was opposed to slavery. And he talked about abolition. And in fact, during the time of this, uh, before the Civil War, when uh, people with slaves were being treated very badly, and many of them wanted to escape from the South, he was, uh, his church was on the uh, Underground Railway. And what happened was that uh, uh, he, who was a pacifist, also wrote his sermons sitting in his office in the church with a loaded pistol on his desk, which sounds like a total contradiction, unless you remember that the church was a way station on the Underground Railway, and he had to be ready in case someone came in to raid the someone having gotten word that there might be runaway slaves in the basement of the church came in to uh, get them. Parker was, uh, he created a major scandal in the Boston area so that ministers shunned him completely. Even other Unitarian ministers would cross the street rather than speak to him after this scandal. And the scandal was that Theodore Parker said, it doesn't matter whether or not Jesus ever lived. There is no problem if Jesus never lived and it's just a story because the message of Christianity is so important that it would have survived without Jesus. And that at the time was a horrible heresy, but one at time went on that more and more Unitarians uh, believed in. The Universalists meanwhile were arguing over whether you had to go to hell for a little while, but then would be saved, or you were just automatically saved no matter what you did while you were alive. And those two points were heretical within Universalism, and of course, totally heretical.
heretical for Christianity in general. The next major heresy was probably when women started becoming more, uh, more uh, forward thinking and forward looking and they stood up for the rights of women. And I'm still talking about in the 1900s here, perhaps the most famous uh, uh, one of the feminists that was a Unitarian, someone that I think all of you will recognize is Louisa May Alcott, who is best known for having written great novels, but she was a Unitarian and she did believe that women were equal. So I kind of like her because I'm a feminist among other things. And uh, the, the women work not only for the right to vote, but they, they also, by the way, were uh, opposed to alcohol because there were so many women around that era whose husbands were alcoholic and would then come home and beat their wives and they were living in poverty because the income uh, for the family was being uh, spent on uh, being drunk up, so to speak. And uh, um, that has morphed into other issues around feminism as time went on, but I think we're still pretty heretical about feminism. And then the one, again, that I know you will recognize was in the early 20th century when the Humanist Manifesto was written. And that was the point at which Unitarians and Universalists started coming out and saying, we're atheists. We don't believe in God or a higher power. And so, the Humanist Manifesto was signed by both Unitarians and Universalists and the second version of it as well. Uh, I think initially most of the signers from the two traditions were uh, the clergy, but certainly that was transferred and translated to the uh, congregations that they served. Over the period of about a hundred years, the Unitarians and Universalists talked to each other a lot because they really recognized they had a great deal in common and going beyond simply that it was in their nature to be uh, heretical. And about a hundred years before 1961, the young people in the church, the Sunday schools and the youth wanted to join together because in various towns and cities across this country, they recognized friends who were in each of these congregations. And so we like to point out that it was our youth that led us to the final merger, which occurred in 1961 and uh, we became the Unitarian Universalist Association. And from that point on, nobody is just a Unitarian or just a Universalist. You, when you become one, you become the other. And those of us that are clergy uh, have to go through a lot of reading about both these faith traditions. I've condensed it down and how'd I do? probably close to 15 minutes. I've condensed it down to not much more than 15 minutes. And believe me, when I was in seminary, it was years. So uh, I guess what I would say is our current heresy would be things like our strong support of anti-racism and our strong support of LGBTQIA uh, uh, people and of being inclusive. We don't say you're only a good person if you're a UU. We, uh, we choose to associate with people of all the major faiths 
and we choose to believe them. Jason kind of stole, uh, stole my thunder because I was going to talk about the six sources and say that our wisdom comes, uh, one of the sources is all the good books, all the uh, uh, books that various religions use. So when I was in seminary, I took three courses in Islam. I took courses in Asian religions. I took classes in uh, uh, Christianity as well as the things that I studied that were more directly Unitarian Universalist. Uh, in addition to the humanist part of our sources, we believe in the prophetic voices of men and women who have taught us things we need to know about doing good in the world. They aren't only clergy people. We also believe in our own sense of what might be, uh, we, it, we, it's called, I'm looking here, I made a note. Yes, our personal direct experience of mystery and wonder. And we believe that's an important part for each of us in terms of what we are going to uh, believe or understand or hold at our core as what governs how we make choices about what we do in life. And then the sixth source, which was added after I was in seminary. And so I got to see the intense argument over the sixth source, which is about earth-based spirituality and earth-based wisdom. And uh, we got it in there. For those of us that believe there is much to be learned from pagan and indigenous beliefs and re uh, religious practices. So, Karen, this, this is a perfect place for me to ask the special question. Yeah. Because you just brought it up. So do current Unitarian Universalists believe in God or a higher power? And the answer is some do. And <clears throat> there are some people who, are, who call themselves Christian UUs. There are some people who call themselves Unitarians and they follow the Jewish beliefs or the Hebrew Bible. And there are people from all sorts of religious faiths that accept a higher power and yet are Unitarians. What I will tell you is that <clears throat> I believe there is something more than what we see in the concrete world. I don't understand it, and I paraphrase Groucho Marx and say any God I could understand, I wouldn't bother believing in. But I personally believe that God is in the world as love. And I've suggested when people want to argue my but God is better than yours, if you substitute the word love for God, we, the argument goes away. And uh, at interfaith groups, I've actually had some success with that. So we don't, we don't say that one must believe in God or that one can't believe in God. It's part of our inclusivity that we say you're going to have to figure out what your beliefs are. That's the right, that's the next screen I was hoping for, Jeremy. Uh, if you look at the fourth principle, our fourth, oh, we have seven principles and we are currently in the process of looking at an eighth principle. The congregation I'm part of in Fullerton has accepted it. So that congregation has eight principles now. But the fourth principle calls us to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. And that is an absolute in our minds. It's each person's obligation to decide what is truth. That's been a big topic lately in this country and to find meaning in life. 
And nobody gets to tell a UU what meaning is. And we argue a lot about what truth is because we love to argue. We call it discussion, but basically, uh, since we also want to follow the first principle, it's a, we can argue, but not insultingly, because the first tip principle is we follow the inherent worth. We we support the idea of inherent worth and dignity of every person, and that means. If you believe something that I think isn't true, that does not that does not allow me the right to say, well, that's just stupid, or you just don't know what you're talking about. What I can say in response is that's different from the way I understand it. I think the first principle is the hardest one to do because there are times when I want to say that's just stupid or you are absolutely wrong. And I suppose that happens to almost everybody sooner or later. If I do that, I am violating one of the basic understandings of my faith tradition. Uh, justice, equity, and compassion in human relation. I, I don't find that as hard to follow because even if I think something's wrong or stupid, I can have compassion for the person who's come to a point in life where that is what they understand. And justice and equity are at the grounding of where I live my life. We also, the third principle enters in here, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregation. Spiritual growth means encouragement to that fire of commitment, encouragement to great joy, encouragement. I did a meditation this morning and I invited people to think, to take time out to think about the people who made their lives meaningful, the animals who had given them joy, the uh, the natural beauty all around us. To me, that's a form of spiritual growth. It does not, it does not have to be mystical, magical, or any of those things. An atheist can still appreciate fellow humans, animals, and natural beauty. Uh, the fifth principle, the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process. And that's why a lot of us are politically very active. The sixth principle, the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Wow. I, in many ways, I could say that's the most difficult of them because what's been happening in the Middle East this past week, I don't know how I can say it's awful and I'm sorry and I hope that it comes to an end that is peaceful, but I don't know what I can do to make that happen. It's hard enough to keep peace in my family. I have three dogs in the room that are actually behaving pretty well right now, but I may have to get up and put them out if they decide not to be peaceful. And then finally, respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are a part. A lot of people view this as a corollary to the sixth source that talks about climate control and natural beauty and uh, all that kind of stuff. I think it goes way beyond that. It certainly is part of appreciating and taking care of the natural world, but it's also what hurts you hurts me. When anyone is suffering, I'm suffering. And as Martin Luther King famously said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So for me, that's more uh, the more meaningful part of the interdependent web of all existence. 
The new one is about anti-racism. And we're seeing that, we're seeing that and other oppressions all over the place. And a lot of us are taking time to focus on that. We think that's really uh, worth our time, our energy, and that fire of commitment I started out with. I wanted to uh, kind of summarizing because Jeremy asked me, he said, I, when I asked him what he wanted me to talk about, he said, well, the common beliefs you hold. And when I started writing notes, I put that down, what we agree upon, almost nothing. We agree not on beliefs, but on behaviors and being. The seven and now eight principles for some of us are about how we are in the world. And except maybe if you have a problem with the two words spiritual growth, I don't think that there is anything on our list of principles that is contrary to the beliefs that humanists hold. But I thought, I heard something this morning that I thought was wonderful. And if you wanted a current day summary of what a Unitarian Universalist would be like, from our Unitarian side, we have the obligation to be thoughtful, to use reason, and to be informed about what's going on. That's the truth part. And from our Universalist side, we have the obligation to be loving and inclusive. And when I think I can illustrate those four or five words, I believe that I'm part of the living tradition that is Unitarian Universalism. So Jeremy, I'm ready to go on to that next slide. And I think that, uh, while that's up, you should ask me some questions. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. I, I, I surely will. Um, the slide that's up, what commonalities do you, you have with humanists? And you did cover some of them, but as just general questions, uh, do you, you hold humanist ethics and values at the core of their belief system? And like you just said about belief, it's really more about behavior. And I think Jason said something now, I'm not sure I can remember exactly what it was, but about the idea that what we build on together is how we are going to be in the world, how we're going to respond, how, how, we, uh, how we want to put our energy and so on. That I think that's, I don't see that as belief. I see that as, based on reason and reality and beliefs are based on well one of my we all have common beliefs i don't care whether you're an atheist or not uh one of my common beliefs is that people are basically good and that's a belief because the truth of the matter is i know that there are some people that are basically not good I'm not a uh, Pollyanna in that sense, but I find I live my life better if I start out thinking when I meet someone new, here's another good person that I might share my life with. So that's so, how I distinguish between beliefs and uh, reality. <laughs> Well, you know, looking at the positive instead of the negative and looking for the best in people. Yeah. And, and that goes right to the second question I put up is, do you, you believe that all life is sacred? And in a way you kind of answered it. The interdependent web of which we all are a part. So if I believe my life is sacred, then by definition, I believe yours is. Very much so. And, and the third one, you know, you kind of answered it in the principles when, you know, do you have a deep regard for critical thinking and intellectual freedom? And um, actually, when I became a UU, 
in the 1970s. Uh, that was uh, that was sort of the uh, the way you use believed that we were rational beings and we were realists and we don't want no truck with mythology. Um, I describe myself as a rational, uh, all of a sudden I can't, I can't do it, a rational mystic. So I believe that most of what happens in my life I relate to it out of my rational senses and my experiences, but I'm open to wonder and awe. That's the mystical part. I'm open to moments when your breath catches, when you are moved to tears, not because something is sad, but because it is too beautiful to respond to any other way. Well, and, and like we talked about before, and you, you pointed out, it's that mystic part is also that that firm belief. And I personally share that as well, that there's an energy, there's something greater than me in the universe. I don't need to give it a label because I don't care about the label. It's more, I've had profound experiences that tell me, and they're mostly the profound experiences are interactions with other human beings or other living creatures that tell me there's something greater in the energy force of the universe. And you know, that takes us to the next question where you, you said, you know, about do you, you believe reason, rationality, truth, and meaning are fundamentals? And I put that as an S on fundamentals because there's not just one fundamental in this. There are so many different things and you've answered it, but I'd love for you to expand on it more. I guess what I would say is that uh, I, you put it in the biography, I had a real call to miss ministry, a mystical one. I, over the years uh, since I started the seminary, I've talked to a couple hundred clergy people that are you use, and the great bulk of them will say, well, I didn't have a call to ministry. I, and then they tell a story, and when they get done, I look at them and I say, I don't know, that sounds like a call to me. <laughs> that, in other words, do we define things as rational and reasoning, reasonable, uh, that they can't have also an emotional content or a, uh, a, a kind of content that could be interpreted as something more than just sheer coincidence. Yes, very much so. I yeah. mean, and, and I personally have so much trouble believing in coincidence because there just seem to be, you know, especially as someone who's a social psychologist, I study patterns of behavior and I see the patterns and I realize, at least in my mind and being, there is no such thing as a coincidence. Things have an, there's an ordination to things. Things have an ordinal way of just working out. And to me, that greater pattern tells me there's something that's, that's making it or maneuvering it into place. But I don't want to go down the religious chain because to me, I don't buy it as religion. I think it's more just science and energy and the way the, the universe ebbs and flows. And, and a call to ministry doesn't have to be a disembodied spirit. There was one day when I was still at the church in Costa Mesa, when a person that had done a, a part of the service walked by me. I was talking to a bunch of people and I thanked him for what he'd done. And as he walked on, I said, you should think about ministry. And I literally caught my breath. I have never said that to anyone else. I don't believe that I should be calling someone to ministry. He's my minister now. And uh, he stopped in his tracks as well. So I believe that very casual comment was part of his call to ministry. And for me, 
that gives it a mystical, uh, emotional kind of importance. Well, and I'm, I'm so glad you tied that together, not just mystical, but emotional, because so much of what we call spirituality or uh, forgive me for saying it this way, the magical thinking is really feelings. It's really the emotions that are in us because they're so profound as an emotion that we we want to give them a mystical spiritual quality. And, and so I'm really glad you connected that because that, that it solidifies instead of leaving it in, you know, the magical realm, it solidifies that it's just part of being human is having those emotions. And, and going on to our next question, um, you kind of alluded to it and in our discussion privately, you know, do you, you desire racial, social and economic equality for all? And, you know, that, that can be a very tricky question. Yeah. I guess, uh, Jeremy, I'll go back to that private conversation and point out that uh, I like the word equity better than equality, but that's yes. really the old English teacher and me uh, arguing about nitpicky things. Uh, very definitely, it would be very hard to be at a part of a UU group and not desire racial, social, and economic equity for all. Uh, there probably are some who do, but I'll tell you this much, they don't talk about it. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and it's, 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 it's a loaded question because you gotta put yourself on the line when you, you admit or confirm that you have certain beliefs and that as, especially as a minister or as someone who has a congregation, that can be very, uh, I don't wanna just say divisive, but it can be off-putting, that's a better word. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that takes us to our next question, which is, do the, you believe that all have the right to peace, liberty, and justice? Yes. and. Um... I'll remind you that when you and I were first getting to know each other in Eau Care, the group didn't have a name, but yes. uh, our, the person who started it called it a peace coalition or something. But I remember when I first saw that this was something dealing with peace, that's when I thought, oh yeah, I wanna be part of this because peace, and I mean peace in the largest, sense of the word uh yes peace um peace within our personal life with the people we meet within our community the same thing with liberty that uh we have the right to believe whatever we want to believe we have the right to choose all sorts of things in our lives and some of us do and some of us don't and justice for me doesn't even need any other word to put to it. It says yes, it, it does. <laughs> and I love how you brought up equity because yes, in those discussions uh, that got a little bit heated with this group, <laughs> I, I, I agree with you because the one thing that always comes to my mind is when I think of equity and equality, and I also put justice into that piece as well, is that there is no such thing as equality unless there is equity. And, and the equity really means that everybody at the table has a equal voice and is heard with the same respect and, you know, consideration. And, and in equality, oftentimes we see their levels and it's like, no, this is not equal. This is not equitable. This is something else. And so I, I'm glad we make those distinctions because for me, that's where justice is. Um, you know, you look at it in the sense of law, and so many people don't understand there's a difference between law and justice. Yeah. And law is just the format of getting there, but justice oftentimes seems so elusive. And I think those of us that are using the term justice and equity really have an understanding of what we're trying to change and get obtained and make sure is accessible for all of us. Like you said, it's it's it, it's sacred to me. Equity and justice are sacred. You know, they transcend human beings. Yeah. And and that takes us to one of our last questions. 
do you, you desire to assist and help all in need? And I mean, whether it's homelessness or food insecurity, uh, we have so many issues right now. Yes. And I would add, uh, those who are in prison are still worthy of our help, even if we understand that they're there for an appropriate reason. Those who have mental health issues, that's one that I know bothers you too. Uh, the extent to which we ignore the suffering and the needs of those whose mental health and stability is not uh, equal to meet their needs. Yes, and, very and, much and so. Plenty of other categories. And I think that the, I'm glad the word desire is there because yes, the desire is there, but one of the frustrations of my life is that I can't assist everyone in need. I simply don't, I have to make some choices about this is a major problem that I want to work on, that I believe I can do something to make better. And I have to let uh, it also be true that there are more problems than the ones that I have time and energy to work on. And that I don't wanna make a martyr out of myself. And I don't wanna suggest anyone else should do that. I think we also need joy in life. We need appreciation. We need love. We need downtime. We need sleep. <laughs> All those good kinds of things. Very much so. I mean. You know, I, I dedicated my life to working with children and disabled people, disabled children. And you're right, you can't martyr yourself. And one of my biggest mantras to people now, and even some of the people on this chat, is that there is no such thing as downtime being not necessary or not important, and that it is productive time. Downtime is productive because it's recharging, it's thinking. Uh, for me, if I sit in my backyard and the hummingbird comes and hovers next to my head and observes me while I'm reading the paper, this is downtime, but this is also a very, very important thing because at that moment, I'm in harmony with that, that creature and they know that I'm not a threat. And just that little downtime is rejuvenating because I'm sitting there with one of these awesome, beautiful creatures of our world and it's commiserating with me. It's sharing space with me and it's basically looking me straight in the eye. And even though it's not saying something, it is by its action saying, I don't fear you because I can see, I can, I can feel your energy and I know you're not going to jump out of that chair and do something. And, and so downtime is so necessary and it's so productive. And that leads to our last question is, do the UU believe in social and environmental responsibility? Yes. And uh, for some people that is their major concern. And they are working on climate, like Greta Thunberg, if, as an example. Uh, that doesn't mean they don't care about racial injustice or uh, poverty. It means that it, what I just said, that we have to pick what most, uh, what most in, inspires the fire commitment for each of us. But as a, you know, as a general thing, yes. And when I was serving a congregation, meaning I was preaching almost every week, uh, you used to treat their clergy very well. We don't have to preach 50 times a year, but we do preach most weeks. And I would try to have a variety of sermon topics that didn't make me a Johnny One Note, uh, you know, always harping on the same problem. And if I didn't feel I could do it, I'd try to find someone as a guest minister who could cover the areas that needed to be covered. Um, because basically the hope is there's somebody in every congregation that's gonna to wanna to focus on race, somebody that's gonna to wanna to focus on LGBTQ, somebody that's wanna to, gonna to focus 
on ableism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we don't think that there's any problem that isn't worth bothering with. Well, and, and uh, we're at the end of our questions and I wanted to make the comment what we've talked about privately and also brought up and other groups were in together is the term tikkun olam, which means to repair the world. Olam means in Hebrew means world and tikkun actually means whole, W-H-O-L-E, but because it's put into a verb form, it actually means to make the world whole again. So we just shorten it for English, repair of the world. And, and that is what environmental and also social responsibility is, is that all of us together must repair, must make the world better, must, you know, create a whole world where all of us have the same opportunities, the same love. Like you said, the word love is so important because as someone who works with kids, you just show love to them and, and they do anything for you because they just know instinctively that you care. And so before I open this up to the audience for general questions, I'm gonna to go to our last side, which is moving forward and that Building partnerships based on core values and commonalities. These are, are things that I think the UU can share with us as humanists. Also work diligently to promote social, racial, and economic justice uh, because this is how we make the world better. This is how we repair. And we need to build strong, enduring communities based on mutual cooperation. And that's very important in that we're not saying that we have to have the exact same mantra or the exact same behaviors or beliefs. We have to work mutually and cooperate mutually and find commonality to make the world a better place, to make it work. And we need to share the ideas that we come up with and the solutions, because if we share and we communicate openly and honestly, we enable success for all of us. And, and that should be a core fundament for, I believe, every human on this planet. And if we have our way, we will get to them slowly but surely. And also, we, work, we need to work together to enact effective policy changes because we're finding, especially in the humanist community, there are so many nuns, N-O-N-E-S, people who are not affiliated. And because Unitarian Universalism, a lot of those people came from different religious backgrounds where they want a sense of community. And, and so all of our communities together, we need to be that voice. And if we're big enough and strong enough with all of us together, we could actually make some effective policy change. Because right now in Washington, in the Congress, there is something known as the secular caucus. So there are people out there who, who share our views. And if we get stronger, we, have, we can affect more people on that caucus and affect more change. And we need to maintain open dialogues and honest communication, which I kind of said earlier, because honesty and openness is the key to getting all of us uh, to where we need to be. And lastly, I think all of our organizations need to encourage participation, membership. We need not only to be supported financially, we need to also support each other emotionally and ethically, and that way we can build community and commonality. And so with that, before I open it up to the general uh, audience for questions, I wanted to say thank you so much, uh, Dr. Stoinoff, Karen, and uh, very much uh, thank you for being here. And if everybody would please give uh, Dr. Stoyanoff a round of applause. And you can guys can go ahead. I know uh, we have a couple of questions. I'm gonna ask, uh, Michelle had put a, a text into me. So Michelle, if you'll unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh Karen, this was such an amazing talk. Thank you so much for sharing everything that you have. And especially for me, what hits me a lot is, is the history. Um, and that, that's really the, the, the crux of my question. And I, the reason I'm asking you is because of, of the history side. So you mentioned that uh, you use came across in the Mayflower. So my question has to do with the relationship that uh, you use had with the indigenous people. What 
what was their interactions historically? And, and to follow on that question, what, um, what sources are used to verify and validate the, the history that's known about this time? Um, <clears throat> I wish I could say, <clears throat> oh, the stories I was told as a little girl in the Midwest of this country about the first Thanksgiving were the whole story. But the truth of the matter is, <clears throat> the people on the Mayflower were a little bit better than the Puritans that settled Boston a few years later. But they I can't give them a clean bill of health. I'm sorry, they were not uh, the way we would be today uh, or would hope to be today. These sources, there have been books written that are more uh, <laughs> uh, forthright and frank than some of the stories that make it into more general history books and uh, rewritten histories. Uh, and there are accounts. There's a group called the Mayflower Society, which uh, I spoke to one time, but they wanted to know what Unitarians believed at the time that they came over. And I had to go do library work to, to be able to go back to uh, 1620 and say what their belief system was. Um, they were, uh, you know, even in my lifetime, what was considered racist when I grew up in the Midwest was not the same as what is today. Today, our standards to be anti-racist are much, much higher than they were. And if you go back three, 400 years, there's a great deal of racism. Um, <clears throat> if you were really interested uh, in looking at that history more specifically, um, I would do a search on Google. And um, <clears throat> I could, if you want to email me, I could go back and pull up some of the uh, sources that I used for that presentation, but it was about five years ago. So I no longer have them at my fingertips. Um, there, there are records though, and uh, some of them are more uh, literal than others, I'll say it that way. I, you know, I really, really appreciate your, your candor on that because I, I find it problematic when we we don't talk about the the things that our our ancestors have done, both both negative and positive. So I, I really appreciate that candor, and I also appreciate that you that you shared that it's different now, because as it should be, as it should be. Thank you so much. I will. I think Jason, you're up. Yep, Jason's next. <laughs> Karen, thank you so much. This was absolutely lovely, absolutely lovely, and. I have a question later, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. I mean, number one, I, I love I love Unitarian services. I love Unitarian services, but I have to say I have a real problem when I go and I hear a Unitarian choir. <laughs> and here's why. It's because everybody's reading it ahead to see if they agree with the next verse, and they have to stop the song to debate it in committee. Right. Uh, that is a standard UU joke. <laughs> <laughs> and if, so, I, if I thought about it, I would have included it. <laughs> but I, I wanted to highlight something that you said, and I want, I'd like to ask my question later, because I have a, a bunch of questions, but I want to ask my question later. But something that you said bears repeating, it absolutely bears repeating about the living tradition and this is, I think, the core of humanism. I think that if we look at Corliss Lamont, who was a humanist philosopher um, who wrote a fantastic book in the 1950s, The Philosophy of Humanism, he said that we have a, a, an ethical responsibility to be intelligent and engaged. And to, to couple that, like I said also earlier, 
um, progressive syncretism to combine it um, with the living tradition, as you said, we have an obligation to be thoughtful, to use reason, to be informed, and more importantly, an obligation to be loving and inclusive. It's not, this is not necessarily a question or to elaborate further, but I just wanted to, to, to repeat this again, because this is something that we, we don't always see this from other religious traditions, and that's here to be loving, but not always to be inclusive. To be inclusive is to force people to change in a lot of ways, to repent from your sinful nature, which ironically the Unitarians coming from Calvinism, eschewing that idea of you have to reform the, this, this, this charge to reform the wilderness of the world, to protect the garden of faith, to reform your mission, your divine mission, to reform the moral reprobate, to, to, to make them better. No, it's, it's not just to be loving and inclusive, it's also to be informed. Where else are we gonna see this? To be informed. And I just wanted to say that that's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. I want to do a quick response, if I may. Sure. Uh, sure I love your comment. Um, uh, when I was in seminary, one of the things that we talked about was that we were known as the learned ministry. And I disliked that. I, I, I'm an academic, so I think I'm learned, but I don't go around bragging about it. And about, so it always bothered me that Unitarians considered themselves the learned ministry. And about five or 10 years ago, somebody got them to change it. And we now call ourselves the learning ministry. And I think that speaks to exactly what you were talking about. Yeah, and to go back to Michelle's question, the original Unitarians and on through probably till the middle of the 20th century, they were an arrogant bunch. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to know that you're smart. It's another thing to <laughs> beat people over the head with it. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yes, thank you. Yeah. And very much, thank you so much. Uh, next up is James' question, so go for it. You can unmute James. Hi, everybody. It's really nice to see everyone uh, and um, to be able to drop in with you guys for the first time, which I haven't done before. I just happened to see the title of this meetup last night, um, and so I'm glad the timing worked out. Um, so my name is James Whitker. I'm actually a member of the UU uh, congregation, UU Community Church of Santa Monica where I facilitate um, our humanist group and also work on, um, help to lead our social justice team, which works on many of the issues uh, that Reverend Karen was talking about. So I, I just wanted to say, um, there was such a great presentation. Um, Karen, th thank you. Um, uh, I thought this was, this was really fantastic. Um, and I just wanted to mention briefly, not to take up too much of your time, but I wanted to let you guys know also, um, uh, we have a, UUs have a national organization called the Unitarian Universalist Humanist Association, um, which I currently serve as vice president of the board of. It's an organization of about several hundred members. Um, we have sort of events every year at the annual general assembly meetup. Um, during the pandemic, we've been branching out and doing more online stuff, but that's an organization that sort of holds the Unitarian Universalist humanism, the, the tradition of humanism, which as, um, as Karen was getting at is, you know, Unitarian, Unitarian Universalism and humanism have an intertwined history in the last century in the United States. Both had an outsized influence on social movements, um, uh, much larger than their actual, the, the actual size of their population footprint, their cultural influence was, was much larger um, and, um, um, so uh, that organization was actually founded by the, the original, some of the original signers of the Humanist Manifesto, um, Lester Mondale, Edwin Wilson, et cetera, um, who also, you know, also shares 
some foundational history with the AHA, the American Humanist Association. Um, and so you Humanist Association, humanists with two us.org. Um, um, check it out if, if you're if you're curious. Um, and and um, I, I guess just a quick question, um, Karen, I'm wondering what you think about the future of, of humanism within Unitarian Universalism. There's definitely a sense that there's been a sort of a shift toward more postmodernism, postmodernist spirituality away from a humanist center over the last several decades. Um, we, you, you, human, I mean, you, you humanists, some of us, and even the you, you humanist association, we think that maintaining the sort of presence and, and anchor of humanism within our UU movement um, is really important going forward, not just because it they undergird so many of our values and principles, but also because in our rapidly secularizing society where like church membership has declined 20% across the board in 20 years, and so many of the younger generations have no interest in organ organized religion, we kind of think that, um, or speaking for myself and some of my colleagues, we think that that you know, reaching out to the non-believers and 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 the nuns, quote unquote, is is going to be vital to have a, a a you know existing congregational movement going forward into into the future. Well, I am basically a positive thinker, so I would say I can't imagine you you without a strong humanist presence and. I think it's sad that our younger generation doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, I would. I was thinking when Jeremy and I were talking a few minutes ago that I would point out that this coming week I'm going to a UU event that is a discussion <clears throat> of what's going on in the Middle East and I'm going to a movie night that's a UU movie night where we're going to talk about nomad land. <clears throat> and there'll be at least one book club meeting. And, you know, we do a huge number of things from UU congregations that aren't just a su Sunday service. You, you would know that from Santa Monica. And that's part of what I'm, I'm easily bored. And so it's important to me to have lots of good variety in my life and to have a, a, a sense of fun as well as a sense of uh, spirituality, which, as I said, is emotion and loving and those kinds of things, not a seance or <laughs> something of the magical variety. Well, thank you so much, Karen. And up next, uh, Randy, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. A couple of things I wanted to mention. Um, first of all, in the chat, I posted that about 30 to 40% of people in the congregations I've been around with have been part of what we loosely refer to as the AHA group, agnostics, humanists, and atheists. That also seems to be, and I've been part of about five different UU churches ranging from Santa Monica down to San Diego and many in between. It also seems to be the largest um, faith group in UU churches. I don't know if that's accurate. Karen may want to refer to that. But you'll have groups of, of Buddhist UUs. You'll have groups of Jewish UUs. But the ahas seem to be the largest um, lump in most congregations. The other thing that I wanted to mention is I, I was typing this in the chat when I was called on, um, so I don't have it done yet. But there's a neat website that has a 20 question quiz called the Belief Omatic. And uh, what it does is you take the quiz and it, it, and it asks you what, what your perspectives are on various religious tenets. Do you believe in God? Uh, do you believe in an afterlife? And then there's a little slider at the bottom where you can do you can explain whether that's really important or not at all important. At the end of the quiz, it then emails you back what religious beliefs you have that are most closely aligned with other religions. So I found I was Unitarian and I was Buddhist and I was Quaker and it was kind of a neat thing to look at. Um, and it, it, it helped me understand what my where my philosophies have come from in this life. Um, 
So you want to respond to that uh, perspective on whether the AHA groups still comprise a large voting block, we'll say, of UU congregations, Karen? Yeah, I think you have, uh, you're saying 30 to 40 percent come to your group. I would guarantee you, and I know that congregation pretty darn well, since I served it for 13 years, uh, I would guarantee you there are far more of, the, of them than that that would define themselves as atheists or wouldn't want to define themselves at all. Don't, don't feel that the theism, atheism uh, divide is, uh, I don't like it. I call myself a rational mystic. That's neither theist nor atheist. But I don't see that it has changed. I think that uh, I'd be more apt to say the changes in how many people are joining us. And that would include groups within groups as well as, uh, well, for instance, out of the 200 people in the Fullerton Church, we might get at most 20 people going to the movie now. There are far more than that who go to the movies. <laughs> so uh, I think it's joining and giving up the time for an event and so on that might be diminishing as our lives become increasingly complex, even with Zoom. <laughs> Thanks for the great, great question. Uh... Uh, Randy, and I just wanted to make a comment to what you were saying, Randy, about the different makeup of, of Unitarian. I, I really appreciate what uh, Karen said about Unitarians. And if any of you need a person who, who drives you around, just make sure they're Jewish. We can call them Juber. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> there, there are all sorts of things going on in the world, but uh, up next we have Jeff with a question. Go ahead, Jeff, unmute yourself. I, I unmuted myself. Um, this one has like a intro to it, but hopefully you can hear me. Uh, recently, Megan Rohr of the Evangelical Lutheran Church became the first trans person to be ordained as a bishop of a major American religious um, organization. And of course, Eugene Robinson was an openly gay bishop for uh, Anglican. Could you please expound upon the openness to LGBTQIA people in the UU ministry? How frequent is it to find an LGBTQIA person in ministry? And how long have the UUs been, excuse me, had openly uh, gay LGBTQIA people in your ministry? Sorry, that was, that was a lot to read. <laughs> That's okay. I uh, honestly don't know when the first uh, openly gay person was uh, ordained. I can tell you that in 1993, when I went to seminary, uh, there were uh, several openly gay people in, in class with me, and it, they were not the first. So I would, have to, I would have to check with the UUA to find <laughs> out when the first one was ordained. Uh, trans is more recent. We do have, I have colleagues who are trans and we have, <clears throat> again, I don't know a number. I know people that were ordained and then became trans. And I know people that were already fully trans before they were uh, going to seminary. Um, I, again, like I said to Michelle, I wish I could tell you that we have always been just wonderful, but you would, if you have any sense at all, you wouldn't believe me. And I don't, I try not to tell out and out lies. Um, when I was in Evanston, Illinois, so it would have been in the late 80s, very early 90s. 
we did the program called the Welcoming Congregation, which was about welcoming LGBT people. And that was a large church, had more than 500 members, which for us is humongous. And uh, where there were a group of us that did the uh, LGBT training first, so then we could lead it for groups within the church. And there were, there were out gay people who were part of the church. But I remember uh, what fun it was occasionally when one group or the other would be absolutely dumbfounded by something that the other group would say. And there was the evening that the question was, but first privately, when did you know what your sexual orientation was? And all the gay and lesbian people in the group could tell the story and not a single one of us. Could, you know, I thought about it and I thought, I have no idea because I'm a hetero and I just simply never had a moment when I said, oh, or it would have been when I was already in my thirties when I started realizing, oh, Maybe I, maybe I could have been something different. <laughs> so um, there's again that learning curve and we are that learning tradition. I think that trans people are accepted but they have a harder, they have a harder deal of it than someone who is gay or lesbian and someone who is gay or lesbian 40 years ago probably wouldn't have come out, or at least even if everyone knew. I had two very elderly aunts who I realized as an adult, oh, they were not sisters, they were lesbians, <laughs> and that's fine. And everybody in the family that was older knew that, but nobody talked about it. So, you know, there's all of that kind of stuff that keeps opening up. I don't know who would be the group that you use were finding hardest to accept at the moment because we've done BIPOC people and LGBTQ people for long enough that at least those of us that are leading are not making discriminatory uh, moves in those directions. And I don't know who is struggling to become included now, because I'll include them as soon as I know who they are. <laughs> right now, I can't tell you. What a great answer and what a great question. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna interject a question from uh, one of our members who's muted and can unmute, uh, Craig, our, our friendly squirrel. <laughs> is asking for a Unitarian, what does it mean to be a good person and what does it mean to lead a good life? Oh, those are two different questions. Thank you, Craig. Um, I would say to follow the seven or eight principles is what it means to be a good person. And that would include the words that I included, the being thoughtful, being informed, being uh, rational, being loving, and being inclusive would be part of what it would mean to be a good person. To lead a good life, well, for me, in addition to doing those things to be good and to make life better, to tick on a loom, uh, I would add to have great joy in life. And I think one of the things Craig, that's very true about you use is a lot of us really do believe it's important that we find joy and have fun and that we take good care of ourselves as well as other people. Thank you so much for that answer. And I know Lynn, you've had a question in waiting, so please unmute. Okay. Hey. Um, good, good to hear you, Karen. I love, I, I got to meet you yesterday and it's really, really great to hear you today. 
I was a, a UU for about 15 years in San Diego. It was part of my transition from sort of enslaved Catholic to um, atheist humanist, which I, I am today. Um, I, I think I left it behind uh, because of, of, a, of something I heard from David Silverman, I think was his name. He was head of uh, American Atheists un until his um, unfortunate fall from grace. Um, and what he said was, you know, basically we, we need to have more nuns, you know, speak up, more people admit to, to not being theists if that's truly where they are. Um, for some of the reasons that, that Jeremy was talking about, the you know the, the political power that comes in numbers. You know we, we see our our, our nun numbers growing all the time, um, but if more people would really put themselves in that category, um, they they would be huge. They they would be a lot more, and they would be a lot more persuasive, and they would lot, be a lot more important to politicians, who are the people that make the policies who run the frickin' world. So if we, um, if there, I, I guess, my, I don't know if I'm making a comment or, or asking a question, maybe I'm just saying that the reason that I identify myself now as an atheist um, and, and not so much even a humanist or, or a Unitarian is because I wanna be one of those people that's making it okay to be an atheist, that's making it okay to be um, somebody that wants to be represented in Congress um, e even though I am, or especially because I am an atheist and I want them to listen to my, to my views and consider my views important. And so that's one of the reasons that, you know, I, I, I'm a little um, hesitant to identify anymore as a Unitarian because I think there are some people who are just afraid to identify as being atheist because of the connotation. And therefore there are some people that might hide behind that by saying that they're Unitarian or even humanist. Um, uh, not that those are bad things at all, but that's just you know, one, of the, one of the things that I, I struggle with in terms of trying to you know, get, get the world to be the place that I, I think a lot of us needs it to be. Um, I have two thoughts. <clears throat> the first one is I like to think that I can handle criticism really well, but one of the ways to get my dander up is to say, you're not a religion at all, you're just a social club. And of oh, course, yeah. it isn't the nuns who say that, it's mm -hmm. the people who believe you have to be uh, narrowly religious with, you know, right. someone else is bad. Um, and I guess what I would say to you is uh, your other point is that um, if you hang, keep hanging out with the atheists and the nuns, and I keep hanging out with the Unitarians, then between us, we can get all those people who don't want to go to a regular church, but maybe some of them are afraid to, because it is true that I have been taken to task for being a humanist or not being a uh, part of something that whoever is talking to me identifies as a religion. And mm -hmm. I can understand that for some people that's a battle they don't wanna have to deal with. And um, all of them are welcome at a Unitarian <laughs> congregation <laughs> where yeah. That's why I said to Randy that I can't guarantee, but I'd be willing to bet that the, no, but I don't go around asking people at the church, so are you an atheist or not? Because if somebody doesn't want to talk about that, it wouldn't feel to me like I was being inclusive to oh, insist. Of course. And uh, more power to you. We'd love to see you at a Unitarian church, but in the meantime, we were together three times in the last 24 hours. Yeah. And I don't think I've met you before that. So I'm not in common. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you so much, for Lynn, for, for the, uh, the very uh, wise question. And I just want to make the remark, yes, and I was on that meeting yesterday, too. So I'm, I'm beginning to think that you two ladies are stalking me. <laughs> I'm in danger. Help me. No. <laughs> but uh, up next, I believe, Zem, you're the next in row. So please unmute. Hello. Um, thank you for the wonderful talk. Um, I have a question that maybe is a bit esoteric. So in one of the seven principles, you mentioned striving towards economic equality. And I was wondering if you mean equality of outcome or equality of opportunity, or do you not make the distinction? Thank you. I would, I would use the word equity, which uh, skirts the issue. But uh, the formal language, you being equality, I would say opportunity, because I don't see equality of outcome as being an achievable goal. I'm not sure it's even, uh, you know, opportunity is even achievable. But it, <laughs> so I would definitely go with opportunity, not outcome. Thank you. Okay, very good. Then how about Michelle? I know you have another question up. Um, so really the question I, I have for you has to do with the, the amount of, I guess, outreach that is done. Is it, is it, and what is the individual you use um, responsibility, I guess, in the church views on, on reaching out to trying to get more members? I don't know if that made sense. I, I don't think that, uh, <clears throat> I don't think I'd make it a responsibility. I would encourage people to do it and say that it was something that everybody could do and it would be good if everybody did it. But uh, you use are pretty reluctant to be told they have to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I would say before I was clergy, that was one of the things I really liked about being a UU is I got to decide what I, my responsibility was. <clears throat> Great answer, Karen. I love the fact that you know, we don't like to be told what to do because I come from a people that we have thousands of years of telling the world, no, you're not gonna tell us what to do. We've been here too long. And Randy, you're up next. Please unmute. Oh, you're good. I wanted to touch on a few things that were said in the, in the past. I think, you know, I think there's, we need to have a big tent to get things done. The UUs and the humanists and the atheist groups, we need to reach out to groups that, like we've been doing lately, Americans United and ACLU, because there is power and strength. You youth have been the leading edge, if not the bleeding edge, of so many social change movements ranging from, you know, way back to slavery and getting people out of, uh, out of Europe and World War II to women's rights and LGBTQ issues. Um, and it only works when people really get together and say, you know, we need to make a change right now. Now, I, I share Karen's perspective. She doesn't really know what God is and didn't, doesn't really want to believe in a God that she could understand. I've been wanting to be a, an atheist for many, many years. And I keep, we, we, we look through the God delusion. We tried reading it in our AHA group and we couldn't get everybody to read it, which is probably a normal you youth thing as well. Um, but you know, does it boil down to just God of the gaps? Is is my belief just something that we're going to figure out in a number of years? I don't I don't really know. But I, I do think the only way to get more political clout and to make the world a better place is if we all keep working on the similarities that we all have rather than the differences we all have. Um, there are some organizations some people out there, you know, the, the first principle of UUism is inherent worth and dignity. And my fiance likes to point at people in the news and say, ah, the apparent worth and dignity of that person. You know? <laughs> um, and, and I understand her point of view, but it, it's, it's hard to you know, live your life 
on principles because you know the world is not a principled place. <laughs> it really isn't. So I, I'm, I'm grateful to Jeremy for uh, telling me about this organization and I have really enjoyed um, hearing the discussion today. And, and Jason, you, your intro was just absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Randy. Uh, Karen, do you have any response to, to, to Randy? <laughs> I know you guys have a history. <laughs> I do. <laughs> um, I agree with what you said. <laughs> We're almost at the end of our day. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jason for a final question and then he'll send it back to me for some closing remarks. Thank Go you. ahead, Jason. So I have, a, I have a question and then I have a couple of remarks that I would like to make. So earlier you were talking about the heresies and I thought it was fascinating how one of the, the premier heresies was, deny, it was denying the essential nature that Christians cling to that Christianity is irrelevant if Jesus never existed. I think this is a fascinating concept. And this is something that I, when I talk about um, comparative religions and I talk about Judaism versus Christianity and Islam also, that the difference for the Eastern religions is it doesn't matter if, if Lao Tzu or Kung Fu Tzu whose Latinized name is Confucius, it doesn't matter if they actually were real people. In Judaism, the saying is it doesn't even matter if God exists to be a good Jew. But in Christianity, everything had to have happened in a concrete, discrete order. Otherwise, the entire house of cards collapses. I wanted to bring that up, that this is fascinating, that not only did the Trinitarian nature of, of God that had been broadcast since Nicaea, the Council of Nicaea in 325, not only did that go out the window, it was, I guess, the first true heresy of Unitarianism, but then later in the 19th century, it didn't even matter if Jesus had actually lived. And that was rather progressive. And Randy brought up action. And I, my question before some concluding remarks on my part in the past, you brought, you brought up that in the past, the Unitarian Universalists had been stridently progressive to the point that it might have shocked the, the average American. What are, some, what are some, some facets of progressive perspectives that the Unitarians are taking on that would be considered quite shockingly progressive and, and indisputably um, hidebound to for the sake of humanity, for the goodness of humanity that, that the Unitarians are, are, are clinging to today to help drive us forward in a humanistic manner? I think that the <clears throat> first one I would name, and boy, is that a good question. <laughs> first one I would name is inclusivity. <clears throat> We live in a culture where religiously, you're not supposed to be inclusive, you're supposed to be pure. We live in a culture where educationally, where, you know, if I have more education than you do, I'm better than you and I shouldn't have to listen to you. We live in a culture where race, of course, is to truly be inclusive to walk the talk, which I'm not sure that we do as well as we'd like to believe we do, but to walk the talk, inclusivity is a tremendously progressive idea. It's also tremendously difficult because if I'm going to welcome world religions and I'm on the board of Orange County Interfaith Network, so, Yes, I, that's part of my ministry. Uh, they're not necessarily going to welcome me. And uh, that's not at all universally true. And uh, I, I think the, my fellow board members do work to be inclusive. But on the other hand, if you believe fervently something is part of 
being a good person. It's hard to be inclusive of someone who believes the opposite or some different thing from that. So I don't want to take up too much time. I could go beyond that, um, but I think inclusivity is enough. If we truly live it, and some of us live it better than others. And I don't say you can't come to the same church I or congregation I go to if you don't want to be as inclusive as I am, because that wouldn't be inclusive. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I have to say that I would feel sad if you couldn't expand further on that at a later date, and we can have a, a great, a great collaboration for inclusivity. And, that. <laughs> and as I said before, and I'll, I'll say it again in just a second, but I have to say it was lovely having you here. Thank you. I learned a lot today. I think that we all did. And I feel a great up, audience. <laughs> I feel uplifted. We had, of course, we had great questions from, from everyone. I'm sure this is going to generate further questions. And I think I think we just feel uplifted by by your presence today. I think that we all learned a lot. And I think that. As I said earlier, the themes of today are collaboration and progressive syncretism. These are things that we can meditate further on. And now the third theme of the day is inclusivity. And I have to also give credit where credit is due. Jeremy put this together today. I have to thank Jeremy. If it weren't for Jeremy's work, we wouldn't have had today's meeting. If it weren't for you, Karen, being here, we wouldn't have had such a lovely and productive conversation. And thank you for being here. Like I said, I hope that we can have, I hope that this is the first of many of these wonderful conversations. I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy now, and then we will conclude the social time. Jeremy. Thank you so much, Jason, for the, the nice remarks. And before I uh, give Karen her undue thanks, I just wanted to remind everybody that, uh, again, moving forward, the, the, the real meaning of all of this is there are so many people on this call here today that are advocates of social justice, economic justice, racial justice, and uh, we are building stronger communities, stronger alliances, stronger coalitions. And I want to just remind you all, we need to continue building partner partnerships and we need to work diligently to promote the change that's necessary on every front, social, racial, and economically. We need to build strong, enduring communities based on mutual cooperation. We need to share ideas and solutions and enable success for all of us. And as Karen pointed out many times during her talk, we need to work to enact effective policy changes based on equity, not on equality, but on equity and getting everybody onto the same level, the same playing field. We got to maintain open dialogues and honest communication. And we need to encourage participation and membership because as some of us know, especially in the Humanist Association, we have maybe 45 or 50,000 actual members. We have so many more people in this country who are nuns. We have a lot of people who are not registered or showing up, yet they are there. And so we need to reach these people because as several of you mentioned, uh, we need to build coalitions and alliances so that we can make change. And the only way we're going to create change on both the federal and the state and even in our county boards of supervisors is to really get together, come together, have commonality and build this. And this, this meeting right here was an honor for me to put together because not only are we bringing not only the, the humanists, not only the Unitarian Universalists, I know that there are atheists here. I know there are people from so many different places. And so with that, I also wanted to say thank you to both uh, Jason and also Michelle for 
being a co-host for making sure that all this happened because uh, there's a lot of production things that go on behind the scenes that you guys don't even realize the levels of communication that's going on when you, don't, when you don't see what's happening. And I'd like to thank all of you for being here. Uh, you made it a very, very wonderful day because uh, you asked some wonderfully interesting and very in-depth questions. And I'm sure Karen had gotten a run for her money, but she's up to the task. And mostly I wanted to say thank you to Karen, Dr. Karen Stoyanoff, uh, UU minister. You blessed us with your presence. You honored us with uh, some very honest dialogue. And uh, we would love to have you back in the future. Uh, to, to bring other people to us and to continue this and to continue building uh, partnerships. So everybody, would you please give Dr. Karen Stoyanoff a round of applause? <laughs>